um, particularly for those of you entrepreneurs who might be feeling a little bit discouraged. Um, he moved to America when he was 18 um, and uh, joined Hewlett Packard in 1978 and has proceeded to uh, found 10 companies, um, total exit value of four of them, which I worked out to be $1.1 billion. Um, uh, he also had, on the way, countless rejections uh, from his university professors and investors to get his first company underway. So if you're fe ever feeling discouraged, I suggest that you talk to him about that. Um, and since then, he has been involved uh, very heavily in um, philanthropic and, I'm going to say, humanitarian um, uh, activities. Um, on my other page, uh, founding the Global Catalyst Foundation and Schools Online, which uses internet to improve, tries to use internet and technology to improve people's lives. This morning, you can, there's a fireside, there's a, a question option in the uh, Rise Up app, so if you have any questions under fireside chats, just fire them through there. Um, but I'm going to kick it off talking, asking Cameron about his pet topic of the moment, and that is energy and particularly energy in the Middle East and North Africa. What is the problem that we are seeing here with energy? Well, uh, I guess as I talked uh, in Bahrain also, if you look at uh, the declining uh, price of uh, oil and gas, it is uh, and coal, all the fossil-based uh, forms of energy is uh, driven by uh, the significant uh, advancements in uh, alternative energy. And, uh, as I, you look at the future, the price of uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, usage or utilization for the generation of electricity already has become cheaper than uh, coal, oil, and gas, and it's uh, going to get uh, cheaper and cheaper, and the predictions are within 20 years, uh, uh, energy of the world will be uh, provided by photovoltaic, by solar, and it will be free. And uh, if uh, that prediction is wrong, it's not going to be wrong by, a f you know, 100 years, it may be wrong by f a few years. Uh, say 25, 30 years or so. So there is going to be significant uh, reduction on the economies of the countries which have a uh, huge reliance on oil and gas and coal. And uh, a number of countries in Middle East uh, and uh, in North Africa and in the Caucasus region are all going to be hugely affected. And that's why I say we are sitting on a ticking bomb because uh, majority of these countries have a, a high percentage of young people and if a big part of their uh, economy uh, disappears, uh, they will have a lot of young people with great brains, a lot of energy and no jobs. And uh, we have basically 20 years to create a lot of jobs and the best way to do that is uh, using the knowledge economy and the access to internet to create uh, algorithmic-based jobs in uh, information technology, in molecular biology, or in nanotech. Now, a lot of countries in this region are already uh, fo beginning to focus on developing entrepreneurs and putting in, pro in uh, governments are also, particularly in Bahrain, uh, UAE as, in, uh, as well, um, Jordan and even Lebanon to a certain extent, are focusing on building that entrepreneur sector. Do you think these efforts are enough at the moment to counteract any collapse that you see in 20 years' time? Well, the most positive thing I can say is that uh, the governments in some of these countries uh, have uh, waken up and have said that there is something going on. In some ways, there is a lot of hope because if you look at the countries that did not have uh, the curse of oil and gas and uh, coal, uh, the fossil-based uh, fuel economy, like Egypt, uh, like Jordan, uh, like Palestine, uh, like uh, Lebanon, 
uh, their entrepreneurship, high-tech entrepreneurship has flourished much nicer and much better in those. Even in Iran, uh, where uh, they had a lot of oil and gas because of the sanctions and the pressures that came on that, the high-tech entrepreneurship was created and it moved up uh, real well. So I'm very hopeful that uh, the things that private industry can do and the young people can do will have a phenomenal effect regardless of whether the government understands it or it, uh, knows what to do or is involved. Of course, there is a good role government can play as they learn that there is a problem and as they uh, recognize that maybe they don't have all the answers and they need to learn. And as part of that, I have been meeting with some of the government officials in some of these countries. And uh, as time goes by, in the last three years, I have tried to have meetings with some of them. And as time goes by, more and more of them are interested to uh, have discussions about what is needed to be done, how to change their policies, how to uh, do things differently, which is a positive sign. What concrete opportunities do you see for entrepreneurs in this space here in the Middle East? Well, one of the key things uh, that we have in evolution of our species, we, have in a, we are in a very, very unique situation that we never had before. Uh, in all of the previous uh, forms of uh, economic uh, revolution or economic development, uh, you always needed access to natural resources and the blessing of the previous generation before you could do anything. And uh, that was uh, why so many things were dependent if you travel in uh, traditional uh, economies. Many times people care who you are and where you come from because traditional way it was if you were from a member of a royal family, the elite class, the rich class, wealthy class, you had the right connections and therefore you were born uh, with certain privileges and you had a chance to do something and you would get a uh, a lot of uh, respect if you had come through that. Here in our evolution of species is the first time that we have the opportunity to use our brains. A young person, a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, can just use their brains, access to the internet, develop algorithmic based approaches that totally is independent of natural resources, is using the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, available access to outsourcing of the certain different capital intensive things to different parts of the world, and develop new algorithms in information technology, in molecular biology, and in uh, nanotech. We never had this before. And the other element of this, which is very key, is again, because men and women are equal in their mental abilities, it's a chance for women to do as well, if not better. And you see in many of the countries, the women, their enrollment in science-based, uh, high-tech entrepreneurial uh, classes their enrollment is much higher, and I have seen this. Uh, for example, since I was born in Iran, uh, I read some of the news better out of there. The first startup weekend that happened in Iran was in October of 2012, and there were probably about 100 people came, men and women. Last October, there was a startup weekend, female entrepreneurs only, and over 100 female entrepreneurs participated in that. This would have never been possible within a couple years to have such a huge, huge shift of the potential for wealth creation. And I'm a great believer that if we empower the youth not to do violent uprising and destruction of status quo, but empower the youth, allow them 
to generate wealth out of nothing without the blessing of the previous generation because that is where the opportunity is, disruption, creation of disruptive new business models that takes the wealth away from the hand of the previous generation, which 99% of the world, if you look at it, are old men who are monopolistic and who are dictators. And as you create an opportunity to slowly, it's not a one year, two year, it's a 20, 25 year process that slowly there is transfer of wealth. And with wealth comes power, comes political influence, comes ability to be agent of change. And that's why I'm so optimistic and I believe that this region is blessed with a lot of very bright, brilliant young men and women. And if we give them the proper access to internet, a little bit of mentoring and coaching, and a little bit of help on letting them be connected to work together and have connections to the birthplace of high tech Silicon Valley and build bridges between that, things are gonna happen automatically that are going to be really fantastic. Now, I am getting no questions coming up on my phone, so I'm just going to open it up now. If you do have any questions and have written them down, now is your chance to ask. I haven't got any questions because... There is one. Oh, there we go. Well, when I was a student, I didn't have any choices. And if you wanted to be a global person, you had to go to Silicon Valley. Uh, now, my basic uh, question I would ask you, and uh, there is, I don't believe in pad answers, just to tell everybody this is step one through 10. I'm not uh, selling you a recipe for uh, uh, the best, uh, you know, uh, food. Uh, you have to uh, look at what makes sense for your own situation. But ask yourself a question. Does this product have an appeal which is only for Cairo? Is it an appeal for the whole Egypt? Is it an appeal for the whole region? Or is it an appeal that could be globally? If your heart tells you that there is certain appeal beyond the region, then if you look at the basis, phases of an enterprise, you come up with an idea, you take it to second phase, create a business and start to make some money, and the third stage is scaling up and make it become regional or global. And to do that, you need a lot of money. And a lot of money typically is not available in a local venture economy. So that tells you if you have global thing and if you need access to big fund, then Silicon Valley or certain central uh, uh, pools of capital in Europe are the places to tap into. Or Shanghai, Beijing, there is quite a bit of money over there also. And uh, that is where I would say you should determine uh, and if you decide that that's the path you want to go, Americans are not going to come to Silicon Valley to say what interesting company is going to make them a lot of money. They have lots of uh, companies already in Silicon Valley that keeps them busy. Uh, 500 startups is a great bridge because if they invest in you and they see the potential and share that idea with you, they arrange for you. They invest money in you, take you to Silicon Valley, uh, provide uh, three months of training for you, and at the end of their training, they invite five, 600 uh, angel investors, venture capitalists, uh, later stage investors to be there to 
give you big money, millions of dollars. And that's uh, really uh, the way it could work. And through that process, you have to understand average Silicon Valley investor uh, does not want to learn about uh, the currency of Egypt or the currency of Middle East or the fluctuations or any of those. They just understand gap rules. They understand uh, uh, dollars as the base of currency and they want transparency and all of that. So a process called flipping is uh, typically what makes sense for uh, ambitious companies uh, to basically set up your headquarters uh, somewhere in uh, uh, America and uh, present yourself as a global company. A few people in Silicon Valley, two, three maybe, or one, and uh, R&D is all in Egypt and have majority of the jobs created here. But those who are in Silicon Valley start to do business development, market penetration, um, uh, raise funds and uh, transfer it in here. That's the model that has typically worked in the past. Just building on that, you uh, took a, an, investment, a tr an investor trip to Iran last year with some investors from the States. Is that correct? No, no, no. I did not. I've not been to Iran for 40 years. Right. <laughs> uh, no, I arranged first uh, at UC Berkeley uh, in the height of the sanctions about a year and a half ago. Oh. Uh, we arranged uh, uh, visas uh, for 20 high-tech entrepreneurs to come from Iran to UC Berkeley and uh, over 780 people, local entrepreneurs or uh, entrepreneurs from the rest of part of US and Canada came to meet with them because many people did not believe that Iran had high-tech entrepreneurs and high-tech entrepreneurs of that caliber. So that was the first bridge that we created. We call this the innovation bridges or I-bridges. And that uh, gave us confidence that uh, uh, we should do something uh, above politics, uh, hook up the high-tech entrepreneurs uh, who can become agents of peace to build relationships. And uh, if you look at the next step, we went from 20 to 350 high-tech entrepreneurs. We brought them to Berlin. and. Uh, over a thousand people came in Berlin for three days, had conferences, discussions, uh, and looked at potentials for cooperation. This was last June, six months ago, to see if uh, uh, sanctions go away, they could build relationships. And uh, next September, uh, we are uh, we have got permission from the Spanish government. We are going to bring 700 to Barcelona and over 2,000 people are coming from all over. We are inviting them to come because we, our hope is by that time the sanctions has gone, have gone away. So any of the entrepreneurs in Egypt or other parts of this region, I strongly recommend come over there, uh, create relationships, uh, look into potential areas of cooperation. And a huge message I have for all the high-tech entrepreneurs is we are and we can be agents of positive change, agents of peace and cooperation. Because if we let the world be run by uh, politicians who only understand fighting and violence and xenophobia as the way to uh, do things, uh, I'm really embarrassed as an American to listen to some of the pol uh, politicians who are trying to go and uh, show who is more macho and who can uh, deport uh, more uh, Muslims or more Mexicans or you know more whatever and uh, who can uh, drop more bombs and put uh, more people to kill other people in Middle East and whatever. It's uh, really embarrassing. It is uh, uh, it's not the 21st century. It's not uh, the uh, evolved spirits of humanity that uh, you see in display in America. And the only way I know to fight that is the good people who share a common cause for humanity, uh, rise up, cooperate with each other, 
do business with each other, promote uh, the things so that the people on the fringe who only see violence as the way to do, whether it is uh, state-sponsored violence by dropping bombs or uh, individual or uh, a uh, uh, terrorism-organized uh, uh, violence. And none of these are the answers for survival of our species as human beings. So uh, we each have a real, real task in our hands to build more bridges, cooperate with each other, get to know who we are. And because we understand high tech, because we understand how to use the power of digital technology to cooperate, the old generation does not understand it. And we have a major, major ability to build these uh, innovation bridges uh, all over the world. Now, I think we have about five minutes left. So does anyone have any more questions for Cameron before I ask my next one? Nope? OK. Um, these bridges that you're talking about, this is, a, this is extremely important for uh, Middle Eastern entrepreneurs in particular, uh, I think. What other efforts, aside from the ones that you are leading, are you seeing? Are you seeing an increase? And are you seeing, in particular, an increase from and to countries that aren't just in Europe and not just the US? I mean, you mentioned Ch China just before. Yeah. Well, China has been uh, very, very aggressive in going and uh, expanding its uh, network uh, on um, uh, having access to the uh, uh, natural resources. And uh, uh, some of those have been uh, very good and very helpful. Some of them. Uh, have been short-sighted and uh, not to the best of the people. If you think uh, the pollution is bad in Cairo, which is horrible, I really think uh, the people in charge should do something about it. Go to Beijing and see how much worse it is over there. And it's unbearable uh, on days. And uh, you know, just using fossil-based fuels and destroying the environment for the sake of uh, creating uh, money is not the way. Uh, to uh, do uh, what makes sense. So whether it is in Texas, in America, or it is in uh, establishing power plants in India or in China without regards to uh, economy, uh, without regards to uh, environment, uh, it is uh, something that's wrong and uh, should not be handled. But what I see, again, as a real uh, potential is the young people. And the other part of the region which has a lot of reliance on uh, uh, fossil-based economy is also Central Asia, the Caucasus region, the Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, uh, Dagestan, uh, uh, Chechnya, Ingushetia. All of these uh, have got uh, a large percentage of their uh, work coming up from extractive uh, economy that uh, is uh, going to go away as a source of revenue. And uh, if you think the problems we have right now are bad, if we don't do something about it, uh, the number of people who are angry young people who don't have opportunity, who don't have a chance for the future is going to be a hundredfold. And uh, that's why I keep coming back and saying, let's spend the time right now, learn from each other, cooperate, teach each other. I teach you something, you teach me something. And we discuss and we cooperate and we figure out ways to create bridges so people can make money together and uh, save the world. It is really a major, major ticking bomb. Okay. And one last question that I'd like to ask about Iran specifically. Uh, you did mention in our conversation before we came on that um, some of the conservatives are concerned about entrepreneurs making, these entrepreneur millionaires in Iran making so much money coming from nothing. What sort of change do you think uh, will happen there over the next five to ten years? I'm very, very help, uh, hopeful. At uh, the same way as uh, you saw in China, there was the old regime and the new regime. 
the old regime was tied to the past and was trying to uh, take China backward and the uh, new regime were highly educated, uh, lots of people with a lot of great education, masters, PhDs in physics, in math, in uh, medicine, uh, very, very uh, uh, big level of uh, intellectual power allowed China to jump up and uh, move forward in the right way. The same way is with the new regime in Iran. Um, President Rouhani has uh, some like, a, I don't know, exact amount, over 15, maybe up to 20 PhDs in his cabinet. And the six of those PhDs got their PhDs from the United States. Highly, highly educated, technically savvy people, and they understand the global economy. And they see that Iran should not be isolated, should not be a place that is trying to go to the back, past, but it should be jumping forward. And there is always a friction, there is always a struggle between the old established monopolistic dictatorships in any country and the new young reformers, people who have fresh ideas. And this struggle used to lose in the past. Now because of the leverage of technology and global cooperation and creation of the youth culture based on high-tech entrepreneurship. This is not an idealistic thing, it's real. Uh, in these geeks on the plane, we have had stops in Bahrain, in uh, Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in uh, Amman, uh, every place. We have had nice gatherings and meeting a lot of very capable people who are agents of peace and agents of positive change. And uh, that's what uh, really warms up my heart, that uh, we are on the right track, we are going to go in the right direction, and uh, we just need to continue doing what we have been doing. Okay. Last chance for questions from the floor. Don't you all no. jump at once and you know, <laughs> ask me a question. Give me a break to catch up with the previous one before you go to the next one, you know? Okay, well, I would like to thank you very much thank you. for um, our chat this morning. Um, thank you for your question. <laughs> and um, yeah. Are you sure it wasn't planted? He looks kind of familiar yeah, to me. Yeah. I think I might have seen him before. <laughs> what does that say on your sh shirt? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> He's a plant. I think yes. he's Greek or something. Oh, no, yeah. geek. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, thank you very much. And uh, do we give you a clap? Is that the process at the end of a fireside chat? I'll give you a clap. <laughs>